So welcome everyone to another Sunday Zoom meeting and another podcast, which you can watch on YouTube or listen anywhere that you get your podcasts. And uh, we had quite a response to last week's um, episode. A um, lot of comments on YouTube and in the Facebook group from people who um, have sort of said that they finally get it. Now they understand what it is to, to look with the Holy Spirit. Uh, based on what we talked about last week, which was this idea of allowing and welcoming uh, what's coming up for us. Um, I wanted to, to clarify that idea today. And I guess I also wanted to talk about some issues that came up in the group during the week. So if you're watching, you're more than welcome to join us in our Facebook group. It's called A Course in Miracles from Keith, but just please agree to the group rules on application uh, so that you can be approved. Uh, so I guess there's been um, a, a, a common sort of theme um, in our meetings together, I really wanted to communicate the idea to you that we have a split mind and that we have two selves. And so there is an insane voice talking to itself in your mind. There is a story about who you are. And there is a sort of you know, within that false identity, that egoic identity, um, there is a clinginess and a neediness and a graspiness um, and a resisting and a fighting and a striving. Um, all that is going on there in your wrong mind. We all know that. <laughs> in behind that is the memory of what you are as God created you. And the Course calls that the Holy Spirit. You know, and other spiritual paths would call it awareness. They would call it consciousness. They would call it presence. You know, the Course also calls it the stately calm, quiet um, center the changeless dwelling place. The message of A Course in Miracles is you're always okay. In behind the mess of your thought, your egoic thoughts and feelings and emotions and all of that and memories and trauma, in behind that, always, you're absolutely fine. There is the memory of what you are as God created you. And so, you know, that's us falling back into the Holy Spirit. Um, it's us, you know, joining with our right mind. Ultimately, consciousness can be wrong-minded or it can be right-minded. And wrong-minded consciousness is this identification thought and thinking, this apparent separate self, this illusory separate self, because the separation never happened. And in behind that always is the stillness. And, you know, we started off very much so talking about our metaphor of being above the battleground with Jesus or being in the cinema with Jesus. And that was a metaphor and a formula, a method, uh, that did work incredibly well for me. Um, I did it for four months. And I did not start from a position where this identity in behind the mess was glowing in my mind. <laughs> or was something that I was um, in any way feeling in any big way. Um, but I, there was this act of faith whereby 
when the anxiety was in my mind, uh, when fear was there, when anger was there, when pain was there, when all these things would go on, I would say, yeah, but what does that have to do with that silent, still me? That's always with Jesus in the cinema. So there was that understanding I had from the start, uh, thanks to Ken Watnick uh, lectures for hours every day. Uh, there was that understanding in my mind that I wasn't the voice talking to itself in my mind, this apparently separate self. As the course calls it the self you made, that's not the son of God. And nothing it says or does means anything. It is unreal, nothing more than that. So I understood that this self wasn't real. This was the wrong mind and that there was a right mind in behind it that was always peaceful. And so there was this act of faith um, on my part for about four months and then something woke in me. And the thing that woke in me was this identity in behind all the beliefs and the concepts and the thoughts and the emotions. And it started to shine and it has never stopped. Um, it does not mean the insane voice has gone anywhere. <laughs> um, it does not mean I'm suddenly a saint. It does not mean I cannot get upset. Um, but I'm always aware of that spaciousness, that stillness, that peace, um, and that love that's in the back of my mind. And whenever upset does come up during the day, I can't fool myself anymore. You know, it's there because I identified as the insane voice talking to itself in my mind. I did not identify as what's in behind it. Um, and so, like I say, that, that was a metaphor, that was a method, that was a formula that worked incredibly well for me. Uh, the bane of my life, since I have taken on something of a teaching role um, is having people understand that the you that's in the cinema with Jesus is not your personality. That's the movie character. That's what you're watching. So we're not in the cinema having chats. <laughs> and the me that is upset is not the me that's in the cinema with Jesus. That's the movie. That's what we're looking at. There is a me that's not that, which can be aware of that and completely unaffected by it. So again, we have a split mind. And they're always present concurrently, always. So that peaceful you is always there in the background. And it's just covered over by all the madness and the insanity that's going on in your head and what you think you are and what you think you need and what you think you want and who wrecked your life uh, and what you need to fix it. In behind that, all is well. So in behind that false identity and story about what you are is your unlimited self. What you are is God created you. That the memory of that in consciousness, always there. It's just apparently veiled by the activity of you identifying with the nonsense that's going on in your head. But your peaceful self is always there in the background. Um, so that was the difficulty with that metaphor. It was quite difficult for people to lose the idea that me, the person, <laughs> me, the individual, me, the separate self, I'm sitting in the cinema with Jesus. Um, and so, you know, another way of talk, because <laughs> I spend my whole life in the group answering the same question over and over and over again in a multitude of different ways. Um, and in the same way, this idea of us having two minds and what our forgiveness practice is, um, I, I'm always looking for new ways to explain it. And another way we went about this, we were talking about 
uh, this idea of falling back and watching the fireworks uh, with Jesus or the Holy Spirit. And it was the idea that whatever emotions come up in us, um, the world has not put them there. The world is there because of those emotions. So that's kind of common to all these different ways of looking at it. Uh, there is no cause in the world. Uh, it cannot make us feel anything. Um, and so we had this idea that when our emotions come up, that we, we don't listen to the insane voice talking to itself in our mind, that we don't believe it, that we stop wanting it to be us. And that we would just be present, non-judgmentally present um, with, with our guilt, which is whatever emotion is coming up. And to watch the fireworks with Jesus until this looking undoes it. So that was the other way that we have in the podcast talked about a forgiveness process. Now, again, the difficulty with that process was that people, because we're definitely talking about detaching from the insane voice talking to itself, which is not you. Remember, nothing it thinks means anything. Um, but the difficulty was people tended to think they were detaching from the emotion. And that's not what we're doing at all. Um, we are, it's very important that we would be fully present uh, with what's coming up to be cleared in this looking with the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and But people tended to keep sort of, there was this idea of, you know, I'm looking at the emotion with detachment. Um, and, you know, th th there's, it has the potential to spill over into hiding from the darkness and the light. And that was kind of like the challenge with sort of trying to have people understand it that way. And just last week, we talked about it as an allowing and a welcoming. Um, and I've had, I mean, first of all, it's probably the fastest watched video in the history of the podcast. I mean, we're up to about four and a half thousand views in a week. Um, loads of comments, uh, like I say, of people having breakthroughs, suddenly realizing how they unstick themselves. And when they get stuck, now they know what to do. Uh, people suddenly saying, oh, my God, I never knew what it was to join with the Holy Spirit. But this this welcoming, now I do. I can feel the peaceful part of me at the same time that all the madness is going on. Um, and I've got lovely, um, you know, private messages on top of all of that and emails. Um, so it, it really seemed to, um, it really seemed to work for people, uh, this idea of welcoming. Because, you know, as we go through our day and something irritates us or annoys us there's this default tendency to want to be a holy ego and to sort of look away from it and go I shouldn't be feeling that as a course student let me go and put my attention on God now that's spiritual bypassing um our job is not running from the darkness into the light or hiding from the darkness in the light um and it's not even bringing the light to the darkness um our job is bringing the darkness to the light And so every single time during the day when irritation or upset or annoyance or anger or frustration or fear, um, whatever comes up, brilliant. This is your next lesson. You know, you say we, we say we want to do the course. You know, we say we want to um, awaken from the dream of death then we need to start becoming incredibly grateful for every single time the darkness rises in us. And we really have to put to bed this idea that I shouldn't be feeling this, this is not how I do the course, now I'm failing, um, you know, or, or even the idea, because we'll very often just something will come up and you'll just, your ego will want to wallow in it and you're going, well, I'm not going anywhere, you're the Holy Spirit, I'm going to have this for me. And instead, we want to get into this idea of allowing and welcoming. Here is the next batch of guilt coming up so it can be removed for all eternity. So 
So we allow it and we welcome it, which instantly aligns us with the Holy Spirit in our mind, that instantly unveils the me in the background that's always peaceful. Because the welcomer is not what's being welcomed. Now my two minds are present. Ken always said the right mind is a non-judgmental observer of the wrong mind. Now again, you are already completely peaceful in the back of your mind. Already. And all you have is blocks to the awareness of that. Thoughts, emotions, beliefs, memories that you're clinging to and resisting. You know, this idea that you have needs, that you require something in order to be happy, that something can happen that can make you unhappy. These are the blocks to the awareness of what you are in the back of your mind. Always. You've just become lost in ego. And you think you're wanting and needing and vulnerable. And you're not. You're not. You can suffer nothing peace in the back of your mind is always there and no matter what somebody else is going through and no matter what their ego is saying or doing that means nothing they are always okay shining at the heart of all experience is the you that's okay and everyone else everything is always okay except for blocks to the awareness of okay. And forgiveness allows us to let them go. That's what we're doing with forgiveness. We're letting go of these things we're clinging to. But the big course principle is that you must look at the error in order to choose against it. You must look at the error. The way out is through. And again, as Jesus says to us, this is the looking that undoes what it's looking at. We must cement this idea that when I get angry or annoyed or upset or fearful, it's like, this is great. This is brilliant. Here comes a block to knowing I'm always okay and I'm invulnerable. And peace, joy, and love are the a natural state of my being. And here's something coming up that's keeping me from that. And now I get the opportunity to let it go. So what do I do? I allow it. I welcome it. When we get lost in ego, in our separate identity, um, we, we contract. We shut down. We shut down our love. Because we've entered into scarcity. There's not enough of it to go around. And so when we say that we welcome the darkness when it arrives, it means that, you know, we feel on the inside that we open. That we don't close ourselves down, that we don't shut out love. 
So I, I don't care how annoyed you are, you can at the same time open instead of saying contracted. Because I do, I do that all the time. So I don't shut down. Yes, this upset, this guilt that was in me before I appeared to be born is coming up. But I have a choice. I don't have to stay closed down. On the inside, I can choose to remain open and welcome the darkness. And in that welcoming of the darkness, I have fallen back into what is in the cinema always with Jesus. Because the welcomer isn't the darkness. You know, it's the decision maker joined with the Holy Spirit as a non-judgmental observer. Um, so there were two questions that sort of came up in the group this week, which were interesting and um, had a lot of traction. I guess the first question was um, somebody wanted to know uh, what Jesus means by joy. Because, you know, does he mean, you know, a little moment's happiness or does he mean like, you know, bliss or does he mean something different or, you know, what does he mean by joy? And what I wanted people to understand was that peace, joy, and love are not like the emotions of fear and anger and pain and hurt that are coming and going all the time. These ego emotions that are transitory. Peace, joy, and love are constant. And they are the very nature of what you are as God created you. And what you can experience in the Holy Spirit. And we use the analogy that, you know, that, that, that you, that is still as God created it, is the sky. And for the longest time, you know, we believe that we're the clouds, which is these thoughts shifting and changing, and these emotions shifting and changing and rising and falling and coming and going. And we think that's what we are. And in the beginning, when we begin forgiveness, when we begin letting go of these blocks to the awareness of love's presence in my mind, we're going to start getting little shafts of light, little glimpses of the peace, joy, and love that's there. In the beginning, it will be like peace if you're anything like me. And the temptation will be to think that this peace or this joy or this love, that this is like another cloud. Like all the other clouds, but it's not. It's just that sky making an appearance behind the clouds. The sky that has always been there. Completely, perhaps obscured by cloud, but never affected or diminished by them. So again, this is one of the ideas I just want us to keep in mind for today's meeting. And it's that um, this is what Jesus means when he says, I need do nothing. I need do nothing. So if you think you need to do something, you are lost to the blocks, to the awareness of love's presence in your mind. These imaginary needs and wants and revulsions and um, graspings that are going on in your head. I need to do nothing. Because you already are that. You might be veiling your identity from you with these blocks to the awareness of love's presence, but, but what you are is utterly unaffected by that. I need do nothing. So that's one idea I want to keep in mind today. You are already perfect. You are already happy. 
uh, what you are cannot suffer. It hasn't been born and it won't die. A body might appear um, and disappear, but what's that got to do with what you are? Nothing. So it's very important as we practice the course that we understand that we're not trying to do something. We're undoing. You're getting back to what's already there. You're getting back to the recognition of your true being. And all you have to do is let go of everything that's not you. And that's our daily work, letting go. Um, so that's one thing I want to keep in mind. And then the other thing that came up, because um, we did have a poignant question from someone who was um, suffering from loneliness and had been doing forgiveness for a long time. And the point was made that it hasn't made any difference. You know, I don't feel any better and there's been no miracles. And I guess a miracle would be making new friends or having new social connections. Um, and again, it's so important um, that we not think forgiveness is where I use a process um, to fix the, a problem, which is loneliness, to fix a problem, which is what's happening with my body and with other bodies. That's not what forgiveness is for. You know, that's the smoke screen. That's the world we made um, to blame <laughs> for the real problem, um, which is separateness, which is believing I'm a separate self. So the problem is never that I'm lonely or what other bodies are doing, in, you know, in the world or what my body is doing. And um, that's never the problem. I'm never upset for the reason I think. The problem is that I am identifying with thoughts and beliefs that say I can suffer, that say I have needs, and that I require those needs to be met in order that I can be okay. Well, that's not true. The only problem is I have identified with ego. And, and the lack and the self-hatred is enormous. The minute I let go of being what I am as God created me with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, the minute I let go of that in order to identify with my stories and my thoughts and my feelings, I plunge into all the guilt and self-loathing of separateness. You know, the voice in our head, it's which we think is us, the operating system for that voice, that artificial intelligence, um, it runs on a desire to suffer and to be unfairly treated. Anytime you identify as the person, the separate self, Unconsciously, you are wanting situations that will cause you pain and suffering. You're wanting them. Unconsciously, you will constantly sabotage yourself. All the things you think consciously, <laughs> this is what I need to be happy. This is what I need people to do for me. Um, you know, this is what I need to have. This is what needs to happen. Um, at a conscious level, you're doing that. And at an unconscious level, you're sabotaging them all. Why? So you can feel like an innocent victim. Which is why we made the world. 
Jesus says the, the world rose from the guilt to keep the guilt hidden. So we made the world so it would victimize us. And anytime you identify as the person, the whole, op the, you know, there's no little bit. You either are identified or you're not. And if you're identified as the person unconsciously, you are constantly looking for ways to sabotage yourself and suffer. Why? Well, because there's guilt there. And because as part of the ego thought system, um, there is this idea of sacrifice to God. This idea that I will punish myself for my guilt in order that God won't. And then in the midst of that, also, there's the opportunity to be the innocent victim. And there's the opportunity to throw our brothers under the bus that we think God is driving and go, you did this to me. <laughs> Behold my suffering. So, you know, Jesus says our suffering is uh, for God's benefit. It's a big flashing neon signs that, you know, of your brother, it means their sins go before them. <laughs> And God will smite them and send them to hell, destroying them. That's why we suffer. We want suffering. So we're not too happy as a separate self. So we can be an innocent victim instead of being the victimizer we secretly believe ourselves to be. And so we can throw our brother onto the bus and go, he's the evil one. He did it. There might be this separateness that thing going on, um, but I'm, I'm not the guilty one. That's the guilty one. That's the one God's going to punish. How many times do you hear people saying, karma will catch up with that person. Karma will take care of that. Well, that's throwing them under the bus. It's like, take that one, God. Anything but me. So the problem the problem with something like loneliness, we're not doing forgiveness um, in order that, you know, somehow the world will give us more connections with people. And we're not doing forgiveness to somehow be okay with the very real problem that I don't have people in my life and I need them. Forgiveness is always to remember what you are that need do nothing, that has no needs. And so when I'm experiencing something like loneliness, I want to allow it and I want to welcome it. Welcome it. I want to welcome this thought that says, you know, I'm not enough. And I need to be augmented. I need other people to be okay. We want to welcome that thought. We don't want to stay closed down. We want to open up on the inside. We don't want to contract into that. We want to stay open, not close our heart down. And instantly something else is in my mind rather than loneliness. Suddenly the sky makes an appearance behind the clouds. And now I'm in a position to let the clouds go. Now I know what I am. So when I stay open and not contract and close down as an ego, and when I allow that feeling of loneliness to come up, and when I look at that thought that says I'm not enough and I need other people to be okay, um, now I can look at that in this open state, in this allowing state, in this welcoming state. And I have the ability to let it go. The belief that I'm not okay. The belief that what I am could be limited. 
and needy and wanting. Once I stay open, once I am the welcomer of this in the Holy Spirit, once I'm now in the sky looking at the clouds, I can ask myself, could I let go of this belief that I'm not okay, that I'm not enough, that I need other people? Could I let go of this need for approval? Could I let go of this need um, for the world to somehow complete me as an ego? And, and in letting it go, can I experience myself as the sky and not the cloud? That's how we do forgiveness. Forgiveness, you know, it's, we say that we forgive the world, but what we mean is we stop blaming it. <laughs> I'm never upset for the reason I think. The reason I'm upset is because I'm identified with this illusion of myself, this limited, lacking, wanting, clinging, needing mess this black hole that nothing will ever fill that's the only reason i'm ever upset it's because i think i'm the clouds i don't know i'm the sky that's what jesus means when he says you've one problem and there's one solution to everything the problem is you think you're the clouds you think you're your thoughts and your stories and your history and your dramas and your wants and your needs and at any given moment you could let them go. And what you would be is the sky. The problem is you think you're a person. God didn't make people. We did. At any given moment, we can open to the darkness arising. And in that openness and in that looking, with no judgment, no fear. In that mindset, we can let anything go. Anything. And that's what we want to be working on as our daily practice. To see that when you join as this non judgmental, non resistance. This light that can welcome the dark, darkness without fear and the darkness falls before it. That's what we want to be working. But every time you get upset during the day is brilliant news. Every time you get stressed, every time you feel like the innocent victim, every time you get angry, every time, you know, you're on the verge of losing it. This is brilliant. This is the way home to God. These are the blocks to the awareness of love's presence in your mind. And you can let them go if you don't close down. If you open and if you welcome them, you can let anything go. That's what forgiveness is. A lot of the time, when you open like that and you welcome to the darkness, um, it automatically just vanishes. But, you know, other times you're aware of the welcome and you're aware of the darkness and, and it's a decision. Can I let this go? And I can. I know I can. So will I? <laughs> Will I let it go? It's just a decision. And sometimes there's levels to that. Sometimes it's something that will come back up a few times. And there's different levels of letting it go. I can let anything go in the light. We've got to get to this place where we, we understand 
See, even the idea that, oh my God, you know, <laughs> I really want to wake up from the dream. I don't want to have to come back here. I don't want to have another lifetime. Um, is massively problematic. Instantly, you know, Jesus says you've one problem and there's one solution. He says, I'm never upset for the reason I think. Instantly, you're locked into the idea that you need to do something, which means you're identified with the illusion. You'll never get enlightened that way. <laughs> You'll never wake from the dream that way. You're locked into identifying as the dream character. Dream characters don't awake. They are awoken from. So we want to be careful of this idea of, I want to get enlightened. I want to wake from the dream. I want to get into the real world. I want to make sure I don't have another lifetime to come back into. Um, that's error. Instead, what you want to do is let go of the error. You don't want to indulge the error and go, what do I do about an error? Because um, there's no error. <laughs> You're, you need to do nothing. And so what you need to do is look at and welcome that thought that says, I'm not okay now, and I need to do something in order to be okay, and I need to avoid something to be okay, you need to look at and welcome that thought and let it go. So the road, the imaginary road to the real world, isn't about chasing after things. No, that's the identification with lack. It's letting go. It's letting go of the idea that you're lacking. It's letting go of the idea that you need anything. It's letting go of the idea that you're not okay now. So I hope that idea makes some sense. You are the sky. You are pure awareness. You don't have to become that. If you try to become that, it's not going to work. What you are need do nothing about anything to be okay. You are eternally okay. All you have is thoughts and feelings and um, lies about what you are and what you can and can't have and what you need. And all of that is a lie. That's the clouds obscuring the sky. So, of course, in miracles is a course in mind watching. That's what Jesus calls it, mind watching. So we're watching for all these limitations these beliefs and limitation. All this pain coming up, all this guilt coming up, we're mind watching. And we are the welcomer of all of it. So we can let it go. Once there's the welcoming of it, instantly the sky makes an appearance behind the clouds. Now there's the ability to let any cloud go. You know, and sometimes it just is automatic and sometimes it's just, am I willing to let it go? And so sometimes it just means allowing until such time as I'm willing to let it go. We look, we wait and we judge ourselves not. So... It's amazing how time fast goes when you're talking. <laughs> um, let's throw it open for anyone that might like to make any comments, ask any questions. Um, and is there anything in the chat box first, Eli? 
Yeah, there is one question in the chat box. But first, I wanted to say you have reached 100 participants. Wow. Wow. First That's time. What I thought. First, first time. time. Yes. <laughs> well, congratulations, wow. Keith. You're getting so popular. <laughs> 100 more. Okay, and next Excellent. we have um, in the chat, this is from Claus. He said, Keith, is the voice talking to itself also the projected, I'll spell this word because I'm not familiar with it, P U P P E S slash people talking out there. So is the voice talking to itself also the projected people talking out there? I don't quite understand the question, but um, there is a voice talking to itself, but it's not you. Um, the idea of a thinker rises with the thought. And so with the, uh, the original separation or the apparent separation, the fictional separation from God, um, you know, there is the thought, the tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. And with the rising of the idea that there could be separateness, that there could be other, um, rises with it the idea of a thinker of that thought, which is consciousness. But consciousness is an illusion. <laughs> Uh, the idea of a separate self um, that could be having thoughts apart from God, that could have a will other than God, that could know itself in relation to God instead of as God. Um, as the Course is very clear, consciousness itself is an illusion. And ex in exactly the same way, um, we're going to have ego thoughts going on in our mind, um, but there is nothing not even in your direct experience. There is nothing, there's no evidence that that's you, except a thought that it is. So a thought arises, and afterwards, there is the thought that I was the thinker of the thought. But there is absolutely no evidence for it. And I would invite you to try that for yourself. A thought arises in your mind. Um, and there is a thought that that was my thought. I thought that thought, but there is no evidence for it. Because the thinker is just a thought like, like the thoughts. You are, you are the knower of it. You are the witness of it. And by being the welcomer of thought, you fall back into that witness position. So I hope that makes some sense. I wasn't quite clear on the question, but I hope that makes some sense. Anything else in the chat box, Eli, or should we go to Dan and Teresa? No, we have one more. This came actually earlier and I have kind of bypassed it, but um, okay. Uh, no, I'm just trying to find it again. This is from Tess. She says, Keith, I thought that the me is the choice maker, the son of God, that has fallen asleep and now Jesus comes along and wakes us softly and now the me can join either Jesus in the cinema or the battlefield. Um, it's very tempting in the beginning to understand the decision maker um, as Keith. That's very tempting. Keith is the decision maker. He's choosing between his ego and the Holy Spirit. Um, but that's not it. Um, Keith is the ego. It's the separate self. It's the idea of separateness. It's the self we made that's not the son of God. And nothing it says or does means anything. It is unreal. Nothing more than that. So the decision maker is consciousness. You know, Jesus says that, you know, um, consciousness is the decision maker. It can, it can receive information for above, from above or below. 
Uh, so the idea of separateness, which is below, which is ego, or the, the idea that there's no separateness, uh, which is what's above, which is the Holy Spirit. So consciousness can be right-minded or wrong-minded. So this idea of the thinker of the thought of separateness that arose at the separation, um, the mind of consciousness split. There were two ways of looking at this idea that there's a me that's not the oneness joined as one in heaven. It's split into ego that says, um, there's a me. Um, this is true. And it's split into Holy Spirit, which is just the memory of oneness. Where there's no me. <laughs> and so the decision maker is consciousness. And consciousness can decide to be wrong-minded or right-minded. So that's the idea of the decision maker. Um, but, but it's quite important. You know, consciousness, we talk about the idea of a decision maker, but there's no such thing as a decision maker by itself. There's, it's one or the other. So there's only consciousness aligned with the idea of separateness, which is ego, or there is consciousness aligned with the idea that there's no separateness, which is um, Holy Spirit. So it's not like there's a there's a, a decision maker by itself going, shall I choose the ego thought system or shall I choose the Holy Spirit thought system? There's not. There's just um, consciousness either identified with separateness or identified with oneness. So, yes, yes, Keith, I get that. And then there is that famous sentence, uh, step back. So for me, there is somewhere uh, uh, there, there, there is a step, there is a decision. I can go along with looking at the world and think it is real and it's it, is, it punishes me and and I can step back. So th there is a, a moment of decision somewhere, yes. I guess. Somewhere. Yes. <laughs> yes. It because, feels like that. Yeah, because you have you you have a split mind. Yeah. And and there is always the there's always the option to identify as the insane voice talking to itself and the innocent victim and the thing that lacks and the thing that thinks it can suffer and wants and needs. So the voice in your head and the body, there is always the opportunity to lose yourself and go unconscious in that and think it's you. That's always available to you. But at any given moment, you can also be what is aware of that, but not that. So again, the sole purpose of the right mind or the Holy Spirit is the undoing of the wrong mind. So when we talk about falling back, we're not talking about falling back to escape from the darkness. Um, we are falling back to be that which can witness the darkness, but isn't the darkness. So yes, that can very much so feel like a stepping back. And that would have been our you know, the idea that I talked about in the past and this idea of like watching the fireworks with Jesus and being this non-judgmental witness, this non-judgmental observer. Um, but but again, it's really crucial to, to understand that when we fall back, Keith doesn't fall back. Rather, I fall back from identifying with Keith, which is just a story about a body. And... <laughs> crazy, ridiculous thoughts and feelings that Jesus says mean nothing. Um, and so again, he doesn't fall back. Um, I fall back into being that which can welcome it, which cannot judge it, which cannot have an, an opinion on it, which can, which will not make, have a commentary on it. I'm falling back into that, which we can call awareness. So I hope that makes sense, Tess. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank so it's you. one or the other. Either either you are 
the body, and that goes for the mental and the psychological body, or you are that which is aware of the body, physical and psychological, non-judgmentally. That's the two choices. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Tess. What okay, we, we have, like? um, there's a little bit more in the chat, but the hand raises are ready because the chat came after, the rest of the chat came after them. So go ahead, Dan and cool. Tess, unmute yourself. Teresa. Or, Teresa, I'm sorry, yes. That's okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Keith. I'm just absorbing everything and I'm finding it so helpful, so thank you. Um, I, I am finding that when I get um, anger arising or anything, that I am learning to notice it and, and make a decision that feels very, very lovely. And, um, but what came up, I was last week, and I didn't bring it up last week because, you know, we ran out of time. And then I've let it go during the week and now it's hopped back up again in my mind. So um, there was a lady that spoke about um, one, I can't exactly remember, but it was something about her feeling that she was going to do more harm than good for, yes. for um, somebody. And, uh, and it suddenly awoken um, a memory in my mind that I put away a long time ago. Brilliant. <laughs> so this memory came up and it's uh, came up again now today. But, um, you know, many years ago, I, I still drift off into my thinking. Um, we all do, we all do. <laughs> <laughs> and and I catch it quicker. But years ago, I used to drift off and make up stories for honestly for hours and a long, long time, I'm completely mad. Well, one of these thoughts was um, that my, a person that was very close, he was like a father, um, was going to die. And I went off into this story about him dying and. Um, I was even crying. I was really there in the grief. And then I suddenly thought, this is so painful. Stop thinking like this. So I came out of it. But the next day he died. Okay. And I thought, oh, for goodness sake, I killed him. And I've held, <laughs> on, to the, I have held on to that fear and that grief. And well, that, that awful, I'm evil in some way that yes. I made this happen. Yes. You know, and it was there in my head and I just just never handed it over and, and and then just recently I started off again I started to have a thought about somebody say my brother for instance yes and I started to think oh I feel so awful if he dies of a heart attack and oh and I thought don't you go there you don't yeah. kill him off as well <laughs> with your awful <laughs> thoughts and um and so, you know, it's one thing feeling angry and feeling, I mean, I actually remember one day before the course feeling so lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, this is before I met Dan. I met Dan 23 years ago. Okay. And, um, and I thought, I feel so lonely. I'm just not meeting anyone. And, you know, and it's just not happening. And, and something came to my mind to just allow, allow the loneliness, just feel it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I accepted at that moment that I could live on my own and, um, and it would be okay. It wouldn't be the best because I imagine like Cinderella, I would find somebody, and, but I allowed it to be. And then quite shortly afterwards, Dan came in my life. And it was, it was just, I'm just mentioning that, but this is different. This is more like I'm making this thought up. I'm making up a story and it's damaging. It's evil. It's bad. And it's, can kill, it has power. Mm -hmm. oh, and I just wondered, have you got any, <laughs> have you got any thoughts about that at all? 
so first of all, it's it's not an uncommon thing um, at all. <laughs> um, you're not the spawn of Satan or anything like that, or is it? <laughs> I was, as you were speaking, I was trying to remember the psychological term for it. Um, uh, it's so it's so common. There's a psychological um, term for it. Um, um, paraphrasing, it's something to do with like you know infinite power. Um, and it's very common that, you know, people would have a thought about someone dying and then they die and then they hold on to terrible guilt about it and punish themselves for years afterwards. So it's very common and psychologists would be on the lookout for it. Um, and, 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 you know, it's the exact same thing with the course. Um, so, you know, no, you can't kill someone with your thoughts. Um, <laughs> but, and, and again, you know, really, um, it's very important in these situations to understand that the guilt was, is always in us first. We made the world to cover the guilt. So the guilt always comes first. Okay. So guilt doesn't have its origin really in anything we've done in, in the world or what's happened to us or any of those sort of things. Um, but again, it's just with, with that thought um, of having that thought about someone dying and then coincidentally they happen to die. It's just, again, what you would do, Teresa, is you would welcome that thought and you would welcome the idea that you you're a bad person or you're guilty and and you don't close down you don't look at it in fear you you open and you look at it um and at that point you say well can i let go of believing that and so it it that that's that's what our forgiveness process is it's that it's looking and welcoming at that idea look i'm such a bad person i murdered someone with my mind and and at that point you know once you stay open and you don't close down in fear and a contraction is an ego you know the openness is not the ego that which is welcoming is not the ego and once that sky is present in your mind amidst the clouds you can let any cloud go would that make sense oh it would it would. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna really try that um, yeah. in the quietness of my mind and heart. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, but the Thank secret you. is in the welcoming, um, where whereby you you let all fear of looking at it go, and you let all the idea that it's guilty go, and you just say you welcome that being there, and that's where the power lies. Because now that puts you identified as the sky and not the clouds if that makes sense. Thank you, Peter. On the idea, um, I think, um, yeah, I think this is worth talking about. Let me dig out. I love um, the song of prayer. Uh, might be my favorite part of A Course in Miracles. <laughs> um, it is a wonderful synopsis of the course i'm not saying it's a replacement for the course right it's a synopsis uh but it's also a wonderful cleaning up of the course and a wonderful correction of the ways we might misunderstand the course and so i want to have a look here at the song of prayer and i want to do this Teresa, because of what you said about you letting go of the need to be with someone and then along comes down. And actually, I didn't realize you two were a couple. I don't know why that never occurred to me that it didn't. So there you go. You learn something new every day. Um, and so based on that thing you've said, Teresa, because that is so powerful. Um, because I think some people thought maybe I was a little cold when someone asked about loneliness in the group. And I said, forgiveness is letting go of the need for other people. I think some people thought, why is he not telling her to go out and like make friends and do things? And, you know, um, and and I and that because that's not how you become right minded and that's not how you meet people. The thing is, if I have a situation in my life where I don't have enough friends and I don't have enough company um, and, and that's not really happening, the truth is at an unconscious level. That is how I have sabotaged myself because of my guilt. Okay, that's the actual truth of the situation. You know, Jesus says you get what you ask for. Deceive yourself no longer that you're a victim of the worms. <laughs> um, 
uh, the secret of salvation is but this, that you were doing this unto yourself. So no matter what's going on, I have chosen it on some level, not at the level of the face of innocence, <laughs> uh, but beneath that, um, there is a choice getting made for absolutely everything that's happening. And like I say, if I identify as a person, there is a whole, the operating system of the person is striving for to be an innocent victim and to set up circumstances where I can be an innocent victim. Um, so let, let's, let's do our reading here in the course. Prayer is a way offered by the Holy Spirit to reach God. It is not merely a question or an entreaty. It cannot succeed until you realize that it asks for nothing. How else could it serve its purpose? It is impossible to pray for idols and hope to reach God. True prayer must avoid the pitfall of asking to entreat. Ask rather to receive what is already given, to accept what is already there. Now, again, in the Song of Prayer, Jesus explains that prayer is joining. It's joining with the Holy Spirit. And in that joining, knowing that you're joined with your brother. Um, so that's what prayer is. But now he continues, you have been told to ask the Holy Spirit for the answer to any specific problem and that you will receive a specific answer if this, if such is your need. You have also been told that there is only one problem and one answer. In this, prayer is not contradictory. Now, again, the one problem is that you're not joined with the Holy Spirit and seeing yourself as one with all your brothers. <laughs> That's the one problem. Um, and so that's the answer to everything. But which seems to contradict Jesus saying, if you have a specific um, question, you will get a specific answer. So he goes on. In prayer, this is not contradictory. There are decisions to make here, and they must be made whether they are illusions or not. You cannot be asked to accept answers which are beyond the level of need that you can recognize. Therefore, it is not the form of the question that matters, nor how it is asked. The form of the answer, if given by God, will suit your need as you see it. This is merely an echo of the reply of his voice. The real sound is always a song of thanksgiving and love. When I welcome the idea that something in the world is bad, it's having an effect on me, I need things to be a certain way. When I welcome all, when I allow and welcome all of that, now I'm in a position to, to let it go, to let go of the need, to let go of the idea that I need anything to be okay. I am already okay. I need only let go of the lies that I'm not okay and I need something to be okay. And if I let those lies go, I fall back into being okay. I have left my wrong mind and I have fallen back into my right mind where I'm always okay. Um, so Jesus is saying, you know, this idea of answers to prayer um, should be understood as an echo of joining with the Holy Spirit and realizing you're okay. So it's not that the Holy Spirit is going to um, answer your prayers. <laughs> it's that if you fall back from the lies that you're not okay and that you can't have things and you need things and you want, if you let all that go and you realize by letting it go, you fall back into the truth that you're already okay, um, then the echo of that is that things will work out properly in the world. So Jesus continues, you cannot then ask for the echo. It is the song that is the gift. So you can't ask for, you can't, you, you, if I hold on to the idea that I have needs and wants in order to be okay, and then go, grant me these needs or wants, uh, fix this situation for me, 
um, Holy Spirit, come in and do this for me. Jesus is saying, well, you can't do that. Sorry for your troubles. <laughs> you have to let go of the needs and the wants and the beliefs um, that are saying you're not okay so you can experience the fact that you actually are okay. And once you do that, things start working out the way they need to work out. All the blocks are undone. Um, you know, Jesus says thought is, you know, always creative on some level. Um, in life, we can sort of have anything that we want as long as we don't think we need it to be happy. So as long as I think I need it to be happy, I'm wrong-minded. I am in the wrong mind. I believe in lack. I believe in an illusion of myself that could need anything. And, you know, nothing works out because, because the operating system of that illusion of myself is seeking ways to punish itself in sacrifice to God. However, if I leave my wrong mind and go into my right mind and realize, actually, I'm completely okay, I need to do nothing, and I need nothing, um, then suddenly everything in the world just starts to fall in place the way it needs to. So Jesus is saying, you cannot then ask for the echo. It is the song that is the gift. It is the peace in your mind. It is the okayness that's already there in your mind that's the gift. Now, along with that come the overtones, the harmonics, the echoes, but these are secondary. This is the friends I wanted to make, the relationship I needed to have. Jesus is saying, yeah, no, they'll come along with it, but they're secondary. In true prayer, you hear only the song, which is your okayness, your identity as awareness, which is always there in your mind, the sky behind the clouds. Jesus says, all the rest is merely added. You have sought first the kingdom of heaven, which is, you're okay. More than okay. Mm. All is wellness. You have sought first the kingdom of heaven and all else has indeed been given to you. The secret of true prayer is to forget the things you think you need. You know, please, Jesus, I will be happy when I get into a relationship. That is a lie that says you're not already okay. And that belief, that lie, will keep you from knowing your okayness. It keeps you from the Holy Spirit. And it's a lie. Ask anyone in a relationship if that was an answer to lasting happiness. Nothing is an answer to lasting happiness in the world. So here's what Jesus makes his famous statement. To ask for the specific is much the same as to look on sin and then forgive it. He's saying, well, if you believe, you know, that you have needs um, and then you try to fill that neediness and that wantiness in yourself, well, you can't, you know, because you've embraced the lie that you are needy and wanting. Also, in the same way in prayer, you overlook your specific needs as you see them and you let them go into God's hands. There be, they become your gifts to him, for they tell him that you would have no gods before him, no love but his. What could his answer be but your remembrance of him? Can this be traded for a bit of trifling advice about a problem of an instant's duration? God answers only for eternity, but still all little answers are contained in this um so in the context of your your own question there teresa it was in you letting go of the idea that you needed a relationship to be okay that you released the blocks to having that in your life so by you 
letting go of a block to the awareness of love's presence in your mind, your okayness in your mind. Um, that was your joining with the Holy Spirit. And then the echo of that was the fact that a relationship could come into your life. And in the same way with the question from the person that was experiencing the isolation and loneliness in life, I said, what you need to do with your forgiveness is, is get to a place of allowing, welcoming, and therefore letting go of the belief you need anyone to be complete. Um, because that that's how you go back to being right-minded. That's how you be in the sky instead of identifying with the clouds. Um, and that's exactly what will allow you to effortlessly draw new friendships and associations into your life. So thank you for that, um, Therese. I hope that makes sense. Brilliant. What do we do next, Eli? Okay, we have a bit in the chat, but let's go to Marianne first, and uh, then we'll do the chat before Kat, um, only because the questions in the chat came up before her hand. So go ahead, Perfect. Marianne. Well, let's see, we're at 10 to 6, and so we'll draw, a, we'll, we'll do Marianne, and we'll do Kat, and we'll do the chat box, and we'll draw a line under it then. Is that okay? Yep. Perfect. So Marianne, you're up. Um, hi everybody. <clears throat> Thanks, Kate. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to touch base. Uh, there's a couple of thank yous to Kate first, and then there's a question that I have. Um, so um, I think the new thing that Kate you need to coin is the welcomer, because like the Jedi mind trick welcomer does amazing things. And I um, I tried that last week. There was like an event like a couple of things back to back were just happening. And I was like, why am I getting so aggravated? And then I said, okay, welcomer, welcomer. And then and then I was like, okay, let's just sit in the car, drive, I'm heading to my work. And then I have a minute of meditation. And then every and then I find all these amazing videos and audios on the way to work. And then I'm so like happy and excited. And I was like, what happened? <laughs> it just poofs, <laughs> it disappears. So it, it welcomer does disappear. is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and again, and the, just because the welcome aligns you with the sky that never judges and mm. never resists the Holy Spirit, yeah. which is the, the memory of your identity as God. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing that, Mary. I'm just, yeah, it's I mean, really important. People see examples of people applying this and going, oh, my God, this works because this works. <laughs> yes, it does work. I mean, no, there's sort of works, awareness works. But for some reason, welcomer, it has such a positive, loving a voice to it that is yes. just like that's what is yes which is um it's beautiful it's amazing so you need to coin that one <laughs> <laughs> if it's not coined already um the second thing is i think i already mentioned this before um i've been a course of students um for about a year but everything is just on a such a fast pace for me everything clicks so fast and um makes sense the the problem that i had was I couldn't understand Ken Wapnick's and you made that bridge and it's beautiful. So like now I listen to Ken Wapnick's and it's, it makes so much sense. I get his humor and I love it. So thank you for that because I was trying I to understand. I love hearing that. I love hearing that. I, I, I yeah. love hearing people say to me, you made Ken available to me. You were a yeah. key that allowed because me to understand Ken. I love hearing that because, you know, Ken is just amazing. Yeah. Ken Wapnick's, um, audios and all the commentaries they're so beautiful and so good but I didn't know what was it in it that it would get me all knotted up and I couldn't listen to it but like I would force myself or not not force I would just try to enjoy it and listen to it and understand it for a, an hour audio and then I was like oh my god I'm so knotted I'm like I can't do anything now so I would get restless so thank you for that now um the question that I have is and I think I already know the answer, but it's just sometimes I have this restlessness. I'm at work sitting and I'm bench audioing these um, various audios on ACIM teachers, various other um, spiritual leaders. And I feel like, oh, I need to be, I need to be like, I want to be in a park sitting and doing meditation instead of being at work and and then when I have a vacation, I hardly do my work work lessons. So I'm like, what is this paradox? And then at the same time, sometimes um, when I'm at work, I feel like, okay, maybe my work is not a, 
a fulfilling work maybe that's why it's driving me crazy but because i'm so every time i um, read any books about like the mind and how does the mind work and the scientific of what mind does and then the body and like making that accessible for people to understand the mind and body are connected it feels like all these researches uh, uh, and audios that i listen they're enlightening and i feel like maybe i need to also maybe change my direction go and then but those are all again all the restlessness and not feeling enough i know it's something that is just the ego play mind tricks with me yeah. i'm like if you were doing something else you would be like more productive and but I, at the same time, I don't know. I mean, and sometimes I feel like, what does it make what I do? Because, <laughs> because of all the illusion is just be happy with it. But I don't know. <laughs> so I wanted to see if you have any comments and thoughts about that. Yeah. So anytime we have an experience of lack or that I need to do something, it means we are identified as the insane voice talking to itself in our mind. Um, we are identified with the clouds, which is the ego thoughts and feelings and wants and needs and lack and, you know, clinginess and graspiness. Um, and so, and again, all you do is you welcome the thought that what you're doing is not enough. So you can let it go. And when you let the thought go that you're not enough now, you experience the enoughness. So again, we we lose the idea that I need to do anything. There is nothing to do. You are okay. You have always been okay. No matter what lies your mind told you. You have always been okay. And you will be okay for eternity. <laughs> Everything's okay. Um, there's just dreams. And thoughts are a part of that. But you're okay. And anytime you come into the present moment, you're okay. There's no problems in the present moment. Because the okayness is the present moment. You are the present moment. <laughs> You know, consciousness is that within which all experience happens, by which all experience is known, and out of which all experience is made. That's oneness. And you're that. So you are the present moment <laughs> um, within which experience is happening, by which experience is known and out of which experience is made. Um, so it's just this. And so at any given moment, I mean, if I, if I don't feel like I'm okay and if I feel like I need to do something or become something, um, then I'm simply wrong-minded. And all I have to do is look at that thought that I'm lacking and that I need to do something and, and, uh, and, and, and welcome it, really welcome it. And then in that welcome, I start to identify as the sky and not the clouds that said I wasn't okay and I needed to do something. As soon as you fall back into the sky, you realize I need to do nothing. It's all fine. Does that make sense? Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah, very beautifully said. And, and there are moments that I am that love and awareness and joy and it's brilliant, Marion. That's peace. brilliant. But yeah. at the same time, there are some times that I have that restlessness. So I feel like what is, but it is, it's things that are coming up probably. Then, yeah. then I need to do that welcoming, allowing, yeah. and they're just beliefs what... that they're just, they're just mm -hmm. beliefs that you're not okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but you're always okay. Mm -hmm. You just have to let go of the thoughts and feelings that say you're not. And by welcoming them, now you're the sky, <laughs> mm. and the clouds don't matter, and you can you can let them go which is what forgiveness is. Yeah.
Thank you, Thanks Keith. Thanks a million for that, Mary. Yeah, Thanks. so so it's just, it's such an important thing because you see it so often in course groups and communities. I mean, we've all been there going, oh, I can't take any more. <laughs> I don't want to have to come back. And all that says is I'm not okay. <laughs> and I think that to become okay, I need to do things spiritually and I need to reach. And But well, the truth is you need to do nothing. Yeah. Hmm. So just the one last quick yeah, go comment. ahead. <laughs> um, the other day, Friday night, there's a, a course, um, a small group in our Unity Church. I was heading to there and I was listening to um, Nook Sanchez and it was awesome. And at the same time, I was like, okay, I was doubting myself. Like, am I doing it correctly? Am I doing it correctly? Maybe I'm not doing it correctly. And then this car drives by, has a big bull sign, Jesus loves you. And I'm like, <laughs> this is beautiful it just when when in doubt he will send us a sign thank you <laughs> but those are also illusions because we are thinking that oh i need to see the sign to know that i'm okay but it's a sometimes the, rec the reminders are nice <laughs> the holy spirit's going to find many ways of communicating with us so yeah. you know we, we don't want to overthink it. I mean, okay, what's what would be wrong minded is for you to go out needing that to happen again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you know, take the wins. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Keith. Yeah. Pleasure. Uh, shall we go to Katie? Like? Yeah, we might as well. And then we'll do the chat after her. Go Perfect. ahead, Kate. Just unmute yourself, Kat. Thanks. Great. Hi. Hello. Um, I want, I want to, uh, I want to echo what Marianne said, both points actually. Uh, but it does seem like this idea of allowing is coming at me from different. So I don't know if you can coin it or not, but it seems like spirits got this in the in the mind. Uh, so I would just like to express quickly about an experience that seems to be exactly what you're talking about that just happened for me. Um, I live in a community, uh, of course, a miracles community mm -hmm. where we mind watch all day, every day. It's what we do. And, and I've come to a place where I realize my brother is my savior. Brilliant. But I've had, yeah, I've had this, uh, I've been aware of blocks because I, I don't do emotion very well. I, it seems like the ego would just rather distract me from emotion. And so one thing we do here to mind watch is we watch movies. And this, we watched this movie and it brought up a memory from 50 years ago that caused deep guilt and shame. And it was kind of, yeah, at first there was anger, like, I don't wanna feel this. And I don't want to feel this around these people, and and then the, and then it went into this. Uh, I think it's metaphysical ghosting thing. Of, well, this really didn't happen, so you don't yes. need to feel. This. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, 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 it really didn't very happen. Tempting. It's it's just yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very so tempting. I actually, <laughs> I like actually, that word. Yeah, spiritual ghosting, very good. <laughs> yeah, so. Anyway, I uh, I had to actually ask Holy Spirit to help me allow and to welcome uh, these feelings to come up, and you know I'm having a good cry about it, and and it's it's coming up, and I'm feeling it, I'm allowing it, and actually welcoming it, and and then the question came into my mind, why did I project this, and I realized spirit showed me that this is guilt and shame that comes from believing I separated from God. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had done with it to create the situation that would generate these feelings, which I then repress. And so, yeah, it just seemed to be exactly what you were talking about. So I wanted to, um, express my joy allowing Brilliant. emotion thank you thank, thank you, you for that cat yes thank you so much for that um so um yeah because you know 
it's going to seem like um, in our lives that we are um, forgiving the the emotions that come up in us um, based on the circumstances of our life and based on our past actions and past actions that were done unto us. So it's going to seem that way. And, and, and it's perfectly fine for us to work on it on that level. But just metaphysically, the, the truth is that, you know, the guilt you're talking about, about the separation from God, like that's the ontological guilt. You know, that, that guilt has got nothing to do with cat. Um, uh, that is the guilt um, within consciousness over the separation. And then consciousness um, projected the world and cat and king in order that, you know, stories would play out the guilt in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the way we believe we victimized God by separating from him, uh, the world would show plays all over the place throughout time of victims and victimizers. Um, so absolutely, that's, that's, that's all guilt. And then everything else that's happening is just a story um, within the movie. But, you know, we, um, it doesn't matter. Like, we don't have to go back and get in touch with that guilt over, you know, the separation from God uh, at a time too far back for anyone to remember, Jesus says. Uh, we just deal with the guilt when it comes up. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, absolutely. And so we welcome it. We welcome it so we can clear it. And in you clearing that guilt, Kat, you cleared it for the entire sonship. Mm. You know, because it's the same, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's the idea of the hologram. So um, when consciousness, you know, apparently uh, splintered itself into gazillions of pieces, each piece is a hologram. Um, you know, so the entirety of the guilt over separation is inside all of us, you know, is in our is in our wrong mind. And the entirety of the Holy Spirit is in our right mind. Um, yeah. So thank you on behalf of the sonship, Kat. <laughs> um, perfect. So where should we go? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, we have still in the chat from Lucia. And this is a kind of a, um, a carryover from Claus's question. I think um, mm -hmm. Lucia was trying to make it a little bit more understanding, and it looks as though Claus agrees with him. So the question is, are we responsible for the, for the expression of the other fragments in human form that we experience in our lives? And are we the makers of the people we experience in our lives? It's such a complex question. <laughs> not, not at the level of the face of innocence, not at the level of what you know as me, the ego, me, the person, me, the separate self. Um, so I am at, at, at the level here, I'm not responsible for what other bodies do. I'm responsible for how I interpret what other bodies are doing. Um, okay, which seems to let the separate self off the hook. <laughs> Except that there's no separate self. <laughs> um, at no point in time are you ever a separate self. Um, you are always um, uh, what God created you to be. Um, so how to, I don't want to make this all mad complicated at the end of today's talk. Um, as consciousness, you made everything. So you made sickness and famine and war and death and pain and 
you know, you made all of us. Um, but it's not real. <laughs> it's not real. Um, so, so at the level of a separate self, you're not making these things, um, but you're not a separate self. <laughs> Because there's just one dreamer of the dream. It's not Keith. Keith is a dream figure in the dream. Consciousness is the dreamer of the dream. And, and as we learn to fall back into the identification as the sky and not the clouds, it's from there that we, we see this is all a dream. which is what above the battleground of Jesus means. Now, again, Keith is not standing above the battleground of Jesus going, this is Keith's dream. <laughs> um, I step back from identifying as Keith to experience the sky. Keith is a cloud to experience the sky. And as the sky, I know it's all my dream. And it's harmless. Because all of it, is me um and i am the one who's experiencing it and it is made out of me all of it so no children or animals were harmed in the making of this movie it's just like this is a really crude analogy <laughs> Um, but the first time I experienced this, it's like everything is just like electricity, like, you know, never ending, you know, eternal electricity, and you are the electricity. It's a crude analogy. It doesn't do it justice. <laughs> but it's the first analogy came into my mind when I experienced it. It's like everything is you, and yet you're not defined by any of it. And everything is just like the electricity that's you. And that goes for Keith and Eli and Sparkle and, <laughs> and everything else. Yeah, it's a crude analogy. <laughs> um, so consciousness is the dreamer of the dream. And that's you. But it's not Keith. <laughs> Keith is the dream. I hope that makes some sense. It's, it's a tricky question, too. I don't want to go into it mad detail i hope that makes sense and some of the here play where shall we go next eli okay you have one final question and i think it's a good one to end on um it's from abby stevens she says i had difficulty signing in uh, because of the zoom notice said the meeting has reached 100 participants <laughs> <laughs> yes so question will you be expanding the allowed number and second I question, will. do you need, would you accept funding assistance to increase your Zoom participation beyond 100? Yes. Um, the So we have held back because it's we've come close to 100 before. We got to 95 or something like that. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, Zoom are actually, um, it's, it's quite expensive to... Um, to increase our numbers beyond 100. So I was waiting until we reached a point um, uh, where we actually hit the 100. And like I said, we've come close before. This is the first time we've actually had 100. In, so I will actually increase that. And um, and, and yes, if, if you wanted to make a donation towards that, you can do so. The links are on the, um, you can do it through the podcast. Um, in Spotify, or there's the links there. And it's also in YouTube on the YouTube channel. There are um, some some links there. And, you know, lots of people have been very generous towards that. So we are, yes, is the short answer. <laughs> we will now um, pay Zoom their extortionate money to go over a hundred participants. <laughs> um, happily, happily. So yes, is the answer to that. So is that us finished, uh, Eli? I think one more question popped up here. So we'll go with Lucia again. Uh, Keith, what is is it that determines what 
other fragmented consciousness, consciousness, you know what I'm trying to say, illusions mm -hmm. appear in life. Um, it's already written. The world was over long ago. It's a done deal. It's a movie. And um, we are reviewing mentally what has gone by. Um, and we are doing that in order to um, release guilt. Okay, so it's a, the, you know, why is it happening? Because of guilt. Um, it's an outward picture of an inward condition, which is guilt, separateness, guilt, sin, guilt, and fear. Um, and so that's what the movie is about. Uh, that's why it was written that way. That's why it was shot that way and finished that way. And now we are watching the movie that is already shot. And we are doing that in order to take back guilt from where we hid it in the world to look at it in ourselves where it will disappear. So the movie was written so the awfulness of separateness um, could be blamed on something external to me. But there's nothing external to me. <laughs> so it was always um, my guilt. And um, there's only me. Uh, that's not Keith. Uh, Keith is the movie. But consciousness um, is the dreamer of the dream. And there's only one consciousness. And um, it's only ever been, you know, the, the guilt um, of consciousness. And um, and that was temporarily seen outside of itself in a movie, uh, which is a way of keeping separateness, but being without the guilt. And all we do is we're watching the movie to take the guilt back from the idea that it's out there into the idea that it's my own. And if I look at it in myself, if I welcome it, non-judgmental observer and the Holy Spirit, it will vanish. So we only ever have to stop blaming the world. So uh, we undo projection in the words of the Course. So we take full responsibility for the fact that whatever is coming up in me, the world didn't do it to me. The world was made to blame <laughs> for this awfulness of separateness, which is actually the only problem I have. One problem, one solution. I'm never upset for the reason I think. I'm upset because I'm identifying as a separate self. I'm upset because I'm identifying with the mess of thoughts and emotions going on in my wrong mind. And at any given moment, I can be what welcomes all of that. And in, in that welcome, I feel the identity as the sky. What I am as God created me. Which was always there in the background completely just obscured, but never affected by the thoughts and the emotions and the beliefs. Um, and from this space, I can let any cloud go. I can let any belief go that I need anything, that I need to do anything. I can let any pain go. I can let any guilt go. I can let any judgment go. I can let any, I, I can let any need go. If I think of a need, I'm identified with an illusion of myself. And so we just undo them. We welcome them coming up um, and we let them go. And, uh, and those are the blocks to the awareness of love's presence in your mind. Each block that's let go of just allows you to more thoroughly identify as the sky until there's no person left. But the person is all about past and future. What you are is present moment awareness. You know, Jesus says there's no body in the present moment. And that goes that that means there's no physical body, you know, in the present moment, and there is no mental body in the present moment. It's only given an illusory apparent reality by past and future. So we just keep letting go of beliefs that I have needs and wants and inadequacies and just letting them go. And so, and, and that's the way home. It's not chasing after enlightenment. It's letting go of all the lies that are preventing me from knowing I'm already enlightened. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a journey of letting go. 
of the lies that are veiling from you your identity of what you are as God created you. But it's so important for us to always understand I am already that. I need do nothing. All I need to do is let go of the lies that that isn't already true. Okay, so that's us done, Eli. That's us done. Brilliant. Listen, thanks a million, everyone, for your attention. I hope you got something out of today's meeting. Needless to say, mm -hmm. we've run mad late, as usual. Um, have a brilliant Sunday, um, because you're already okay. <laughs> And I thank you so much, Keith. Thank, thank you so much, Keith. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.